You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Now, alliances are a pretty interesting thing. If it wasn't for alliances, the Prussians wouldn't have been able to save the British butts from Napoleon. Julius Caesar probably wouldn't have been able to beat all the Gauls, although he didn't always do the best with his alliances. Towards the end of the Second World War, uh, a German bloke, uh, or I think he was Austrian actually, didn't do so well in maintaining his alliances, didn't end up so well. So they're kind of important, alliances, security partnerships. And there's been some pretty big news recently about alliances. G'day listeners and welcome to the first ever live recording of a Dead Prussian podcast episode. I'm your host Mick, the humblest host you know of a podcast named after a 19th century Prussian military theorist. Now that's not saying too much, I don't actually need to be too humble at all because I'm the only podcast I think named after Big Carl. Now before we get started, we at TDP Studios acknowledge the traditional custodians of the ACT, the Ngunnawal people. We acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. Noting our global audience, I also pay our respects to other First Nations people listening on the show tonight or downloading the episode. Now, before we get started, if you are on YouTube, you can see our chat window. So all the normal stuff I plug, I've already pre-plugged it. So I've been pre-plugging tonight because uh, it's just easier and I'm nervous doing my first live show where I've got to be a little bit serious. Those who have seen me on live broadcasts on different channels, you'll note that I'm a bit of a clown on those channels and that's probably more appropriate for those channels, but not this one. So uh, if you want to join the TDP community, jump onto the link there, join the deadprussian.ning.com. Uh, you get access to transcripts, you get access to bonus content. Uh, note, there will be no bonus content tonight, but it, we've replaced that with an opportunity for guests to answer a question from an audience member. So if you do have questions, uh, just put them in the chat window from now until we get to that point in the show, and I will do my best to pick the best question. Now, we know that we've got Uh, people watching because I can see you in real time so it's great to see and I do know that some of the people out there watching are fans of science fiction leadership and military strategy so what I would like you to do is buy a book Uh, please jump on and check out the link to the book to boldly go it's a book that uses science fiction to explain national security international relations military strategy and leadership now It's a little bit selfish me plugging this book on this link. One, if you buy the book from the link I've provided in the chat window and in the show notes, you will give a little bit of money back to TDP Studios. Now, you won't necessarily be stealing from the authors, which is okay. It's better to steal from Amazon. So Amazon will give me money, which is really, really good because they don't do that often. They usually just put it into extravagant space programs. Also, hopefully they don't cancel my affiliation because of that. Sorry, Jeff. If you jump into one of the chapters and read about Battlestar Galactica, not only will you read a cracking read about one of the best science fiction shows ever made, either the old one or the new one, but there's a chapter in there about the reboot that I wrote on the Unequal Dialogue, which is really good because as I was writing it, I learned what the Unequal Dialogue was. was. I had to learn it because I'd already pitched that I was going to be writing it, um, and hopefully Steve, the editor, is not listening to this. Now... Big news in Australia. That's why we've gone, rushed out and done a uh, live recording episode rather than take our usual time in scheduling. And we've actually had to push another episode uh, out of the way to get this one done, which is really, really good because hopefully I get a whole heap of new listeners here and they, they follow on with the new episode. So next week we'll be releasing episode 106, which is on uh, the creative arts and war and visualizing war. And that's with uh, uh, Catherine Brimblecombe Fox. So it is an uh, excellent. Um, Excellent discussion, but it's not the discussion you're all concerned with. The discussion everyone wants to know about are killer whales. Sorry, not not killer whales, orcas or orcas. Now, we're talking security partnerships. We're talking alliances. We're talking a brand new security partnership that is pretty interesting, uh, particularly from the Australian point of view. So I've gone out and got some Australian guests on the show, which when you think about it is pretty rare for an Australian show. We tend to have a lot of US and UK guests. Now, my first guest uh, tonight is Dr. Beck Stratting. She's the Executive Director of La Trobe Asia and a Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Relations at La Trobe University. Her research interests are in maritime disputes and Australian foreign and defence policy. Very, very fitting. My guest tonight, because it's a live show, we've we've chucked in some personal stuff in our bios. 
Uh, Beck sang karaoke on five continents, and her boxing name is Dr. Knuckles. The second guest I've got tonight is Peter J. Dean. He's the Chair of Defence Studies and the Director of the UWA Defence and Security Institute. He's been a Fulbright Scholar and Endeavour Research Scholar on the US-Australia Alliance and is a Senior Fellow with the Atlantic Council. In addition to strategic studies, he likes Friday burgers, cold beer, a good meme, and depressing grunge music from the 1990s and early 2000s, and is a serial offender on this show as a guest. I'll just unmute you because this is live and we want people to hear you. Beck, Peter, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks, Mick. Uh, it's great to be here uh, and it's great to share the stage with Pete. Uh, I've been promised lots of dad jokes tonight, so I hope you're going to deliver. I like the idea of the clown. Uh, bring it on. <laughs> Thanks, Mick. It's it's good to be here. I'm coming from uh, Gadigal country, my hometown of Sydney, where I've been in lockdown now for 12 weeks, so I'm actually not in, in sunny Western Australia. I, I'm really glad this is my proof of life video for everybody out there who hasn't seen or heard from me in a long period of time. And of course, uh, I'm very proud to be on the best live podcast show that I've ever come across <laughs> or ever been a part of on AUKUS. Now, this may be the only one, but I think that's beside the point. Um, but look, look, I'm super pumped to be here. I, I have dived right into my research, so I don't get sunk on any question tonight. That's good. I'm glad. Uh, 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 and when I, when I surfaced earlier today, I feel thoroughly brushed up on killer whales, how to jilt your French lover, and uh, an Anglosphere menage aux trois. Can I just say, Pete sent me a photo of some whales, and it took me a very long time to understand what that was. I'm like, what is this? And then I went hours later, oh, orcas. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether you thought I was like David Attenborough and I would get the connection, uh, but, you know, it was a good joke. I'm, I'm proud of you, Pete. The orcas connection was very good. Look, look if we don't have cups, T-shirts, challenge coins, everything with killer whales on this, like, I want to see Joe Biden handing out orca, killer whale-inspired challenge coins whenever he goes to these meetings. Like, if we don't achieve this, this alliance will, and security partnership will never work. <laughs> like, if you don't have the merch, it's, never, it's not going to go anywhere. We should, we should actually be plugging some podcast merchandise. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have any. I've got merchandise. I don't personally have any of it, so I don't know the quality of it. So um, just jump on our website or our Facebook page if you want to do that, listeners. Now, because Pete um, delivered some cracking jokes there, and that's actually my job, Beck, let's go to the first question. Um, so, Beck, before we start discussing the orcas, um, not the orcas, uh, and and I do feel for you. I don't think there's anyone in Pete's contact uh, book that didn't get a picture of a killer whale <laughs> on stage over the past week. Um, but I'm keen to learn about what got you interested in becoming a scholar in international relations. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, it was actually one that I was thinking of the other day because around the time of September 11, uh, there's often a lot of people, uh, you know, around my age. Uh, bracket who who say that this is the reason that they got into international relations because they saw what happened in September 11. And my father was actually in New York when September 11 happened. And I moved to New York with my family a couple of months after September 11. And so you would think that that would have been my formative kind of interest in international relations as well. But oddly, it wasn't. I didn't know what international relations was until several years after when I had to do a second year politics subject and I just went international relations, okay, I'll do that. And then I started reading, um, you know, in the first few weeks, reading some realism and thinking, oh, are these guys serious? Uh, and <laughs> I mean, 15 years later, I'm like, oh, yeah, they've probably got a point. Uh, but I really fell in love with Headley Bull. And that seems to me to be a bit cliched. But I really didn't know what international relations was before I took this subject. And it was like kismet. And I just thought, oh, this, this is this is my jam. Like, I just I thought it was really interesting. And I actually took all of these subjects 
in third year just so I could major in it and do an honours degree in international relations. Uh, and then I've just been at a university ever since. They cannot get rid of me. Uh, and, you know, some days I wonder about my life choices, but all in all, still really in love with international relations. <laughs> That's fantastic. And when we're, when we're talking about people and their life choices, um, I was in the military and my, my first year in the military, September 11 happened. Um, completely unexpected career turn at, at day one almost. But other people who make life choices, Pete, uh, we, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you off mute and now, uh, but most of our listeners have probably heard your backstory. Um, that's most of our previous listeners. I won't call them older listeners. I'll call them elder listeners, noting that um, over the past you know, 18 months, gray hair has appeared in my beard, which is a bit odd. Um, I wish I had have grown a beard before I had gray hair, but you know, it's, um, it's not necessarily, listeners aren't necessarily interested in, in my looks. Um, although the viewers are, um, well, they have been told I've got a face for radio. So Pete, um, your backstory, we all know it, but we want to hear it again. So can well, you give us a refresher? What got I'll, you interested? I'll give you an, a, an abridged and slightly different version. Yeah, so. A new version. Excellent. Yeah, a new version. So I, I, I had, I, I've actually got dyslexia. And so I had real trouble when I was a kid learning to read. I still have horrible problems with my spelling, as anyone who follows me on Twitter would know, um, and stuff. So when I finally got to reading a book, um, when I was in primary school, I, I persisted with my reading teacher. I'm reading a book called um, The Blooding of the Guns by Alexander Fullerton, which is about, it's a novel about the Battle of Jutland. So that was the first book that I ever read. And I, and I loved it when I finally got through it and managed to get through it. And so the second book I read was by a similar type of author called Douglas Raymond, who wrote a book called Badge of Glory, which is the first of a saga about this Blackwood family in the Royal Marines. And I was hooked from, from pretty much that point onwards. History was the only subject I liked in school. Um, after watching Star Wars, I thought you could explain everything in history and international relations and war and strategy through just watching Star Wars and using references to Star Wars. And despite a, a strong allure of a, uh, of a military career that I thought I had in front of me, I realised uh, after a while that I wasn't really a very good morning person and had perpetual problems with turning up anywhere on time. So, so I thought academia just seemed like a natural choice when I realised those two things. And like Beck, you know, I've pretty much been stuck there ever since and now they just can't get rid of me. Well, I'm, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you got stuck there because you've helped me out a couple of times. So, including listeners, uh, being a reference for me a couple of times and and my latest uh, study endeavours. So, if in the future you ever have a Doctor Cook, uh, Doctor Dean is is the one is the one to blame uh, for convincing people to take me on. Now, Pete, um, some of our previous episodes have kind of touched on this, but we've we've more focused on alliances during wartime, really, uh, and wartime allies, uh, but you're probably in a really good position for most of our listeners to learn from when it comes to uh, the history of Australian, US and UK alliance relations over the past 70 years. Can you give us a quick rundown, noting that I have definitely uh, made some time uh, for us to run over. Anyone who's been in a room with Pete and I know that there's no such thing as a short conversation. Um, and that's usually with us separate. You put us together, it's quite dangerous. Um, you run out of a couple of things, beer, whiskey and, and words, but just, a, just an alliance in the past 70 years, pretty easy topic, I'm sure. Pretty easy, pretty quick. Look, I, I think the best thing to frame this for is, is Robert Menzies, the Prime Minister, once spoke about Australia's great and powerful friend. And he said that in the plural sense, because what he was really talking about in that period was that Australia had this in, abiding at the time cultural affinity and background from the United Kingdom since, you know, coloniza the colonisation period in time. And by that stage of Menzies' second go at being Prime Minister in the post Second World War era, of course, we were entering into the phase of the alliance with, with the United States um, of America. And really, uh, these two alliances have sat at the centre of Australian strategic policy and have been really the core around uh, what we've what we built this. As a, as a British colony, obviously, you know, we had the British military here to protect us. Um, this, this was sustained through the, the 18th century, and of course, it was British, you know, military power as well as 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 local police forces and stuff who who undertook the conflict with the indigenous people, the original inhabitants of this land, um, to basically turn it into a into a British colony. Um, we also then served, you know, in uh, in the Sudan in in the late eighteen eighties as the first kind of attempted contingent as contributing to British Empire defence. 
the Boer War, and of course, uh, very famously for Australian military history, um, Anzac Gallipoli and our contribution as the Australian Imperial Force, as the army was known at that stage, um, uh, raised to fight as a part of the British Empire. Um, this stretches through, of course, into the, into the Second World War, but what we find ourselves with the fall of Singapore as the British Empire is overstretched. And we, we go into a, a coalition with the United States in the Pacific War. And I use that, that term very specifically. It is a coalition. It is a temporary ad hoc partnership against a common enemy. And certainly Douglas MacArthur, the US military commander based in Australia in the Southwest Pacific, made it very clear to the Australian government that he didn't really care who was occupying Australia. We were just very geographically convenient for the US forces to, to fight their way back. So we get to the end of this sort of latter part of the Second World War and we're kind of going, well, the whole British thing in Singapore didn't work out for us so well. The Americans seem to be pretty unreliable and untrustworthy towards the end of the war. And we realise we're going to do a little bit more for our own self-defence, but realistically, the government comes to the conclusion that we're going to go back towards this com Commonwealth or Empire and Commonwealth defence. But at the same time, during the Korean War, we work studiously towards getting a partnership with the United States in return for the peace treaty with Japan. Um, so ANZUS is born in 1951. And despite what people say, you know, often the US-Australia alliance is put back to that famous moment of John Curtin, you know, and he's turned to America article in the, in the newspaper, but that was really a temporary, time-sensitive, you know, existential threat type of turn to America. We turn back to the British um, Empire, then we include the Americans um, thereafter, after 1951, but we don't put ANZUS at the centre of our strategic policy yet. We also then get involved in CETO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organisation, which I like to refer to as the Holy Roman Empire of Alliances in, in Asia, in that, you know, Holy Roman Empire was not holy nor Roman nor an empire. CETO was not really Southeast Asian, not much of a treaty and a hopeless organisation. Um, we're disappointed with, with where CETO goes. We're disappointed with ANZUS. We have issues with the United States, particularly over Indonesia and West Papua in the late 50s and Confrontasi in the early 60s. So Australia then basically volunteers to go to Vietnam, both for regional security reasons, but also on the hope that getting engaged in Vietnam uh, will keep the Americans engaged in Southeast Asia and God, what a colossal mistake we made about understanding that conflict. And it ends up actually having almost the opposite effect. So we get to the Nixon doctrine um, and we start to change the nature of our relationship with the United States. At the same time that's happening, of course, the, the Brits announced that they're going to withdraw east of Suez and, and then eventually join the European common market. And that really fundamentally changes our relationship with Britain, both strategically and, and economically. After the Nixon doctrine into the 70s, we, we enter this period of what's called self-reliance in the alliance framework, very much focused on our regional defence, understanding that the centre of gravity for the Cold War is somewhere else. Um, and that lasts through the sort of 70s and the 1980s. And then we get to the end of the Cold War. And realistically, the alliance, which is described in the treaty as a Pacific pact, actually goes global. And because the, when you talk about the supposed unipolar moment, um, Australia ends up in, involved in the Gulf War, ends up in UN and peacekeeping operations around the globe and really supporting US global leadership as the, as, as the one global superpower. And then, of course, that bleeds then into the global war on terror and our involvement in Iraq, in Afghanistan and those conflicts, um, which we've only seen you know, the very end of basically this year. That drives a much closer military to military relationship, but at the same time, of course, we're seeing the rise of China. We have an announced US force posture agreements under Obama, which gives us the Marines rotating through Darwin. We get Xi Jinping sort of throwing off this responsible stakeholder consensus and flexing his muscles in Asia. Then we get the shock of Trump. Then we get Brexit. Then we get the UK announcing it's coming back west of Suez and into the Indo-Pacific. Um, then we end up with Biden and now we end up with AUKUS. So this is a kind of a long thread of, of Anglosphere relations where Australia at various times has also wanted originally to have security from Asia, then are trying to have security with Asia. And now no one, everyone seems very confused. Are we going back to where we were or, or you know, are we going back to the future? And what's, what's really interesting in, in the mid-1960s, uh, an academic named T.B. Miller, who worked very closely with Headley Bull, and who was the first ever head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at ANU, our first Strategic Studies Institute, wrote in a book called Australia's Defence how that ANZUS would not be complete until the UK was a part of that alliance treaty. 
Now, this was slightly before they just announced the Brits were leaving the region and going to the European common market. But now they're back. Um, you know, they're back looking to, to join the CTTPP. They're back with their Indo-Pacific strategy. And, and AUKUS seems to be almost like they're back in that they've joined ANZUS in some weird, weird way, shape and form. See? Easy. Easy. 70 years done really, really easy. Now, I've, mu I've muted Pete so that he can't answer back because uh, he knows more than me and he's quick. So I'd, I've got to be real quick on the, on the mute button because we've got to get through the episode um, with some really, really good jokes. And uh, we're not going to rely on Pete for those. We're going to rely on me. Uh, actually, I've got some really, really good jokes coming at me from the chat. So it's good to see uh, some people want uh, a crack at the crown. But Beck, um, we saw uh, the AUKUS announced in the last week and this is a security partnership between the US, UK and Australia. Um, how does AUKUS fit into and, and kind of differ from the past alliances? Yeah, well, I have to say I, I, uh, I appreciate Pete being able to trace us through sort of 70 years of history there and it does feel like we're going a bit back to the future. Uh, but I'm not sure about how other people have felt about this news. I feel simultaneously overwhelmed and underwhelmed by AUKUS. Uh, there's a lot of talk and speculation and there's quite a bit of overblown rhetoric um, it was only a few months ago when the quadrilateral security dialogue was the most important development uh, of, in Australian security since uh, ANZUS, uh, and now it's AUKUS. Uh, and so I have a feeling like, you know, maybe uh, we need to sort of calm down and process this uh, a little bit because um, I think it's underwhelming in a sense that the details are just a bit sketchy at this point. So uh, what do we know about AUKUS? Well, uh, it is significant in the the fact that going nuclear is significant for Australia. It is undoubtedly a significant step uh, with a lot of potential ramifications and a lot of issues that need to be thought through uh, for Australia. Uh, and it's also uh, significant in the fact that you have the US and the UK uh, essentially agreeing to transfer technology to a third state. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Mick, a trilateral security partnership with the US and the UK focused on identifying an optimal pathway for Australia to acquire nuclear powered submarines using uh, US technology uh, with the emphasis on nuclear powered uh, and not nuclear weapons. That has was made very clear uh, in, the, in the press conference, uh, particularly from President Joe Biden, uh, that this is about nuclear powered submarines. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Australia is still seeking to fulfill its commitments in the non-proliferation uh, treaty regime. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of three key features. The first is obviously the nuclear powered submarine program. I think Pete can talk a little bit more about that later on, but I'd say that this is unique to Australia, one of only six nations uh, who, who have this, uh, or will be one of seven nations to have this capability, and all of the six have nuclear weapons programs that exist, and that's, so this is a new uh, capability for Australia. The second key element is the technology sharing element. Australia is joining a very exclusive club of the UK and the US. Uh, and so this is another significant development for Australia's defence capabilities. But there's also a bunch of things that were that came out around long range strike capabilities for the Australian Defence Force, like Tomahawk cruise missiles, and a real emphasis on um, sort of collaboration in science, in technology. Uh, between these three countries. Uh, so I think one of the things that makes it really unique, and this is, uh, there's been some efforts over the last day or so in reassuring ASEAN countries. Uh, and part of that is saying it's not an alliance or a pact. Uh, so at this stage, it's not like a, a, a large capital alliance necessarily committing the three states to collective security. It's got a different function from ANZUS uh, in weapons and technology procurement, but it is about deepening defence cooperation. Uh, and interoperability. It's also distinctive from Five Eyes. I mean, it doesn't include New Zealand and Canada for one, uh, but you know, it's it's not it's not it doesn't have the same sort of function around um, intelligence. So uh, 
uh, we have these uh, arrangements that are already in place, but I think this is kind of adding a new dimension to uh, some of the activities uh, and, and arrangements that Australia is already engaged uh, in. But what I see as kind of happening is that this is, and, and I could be wrong, but this is my interpretation of what's going on, is that Australia is moving from conceiving of itself as a middle power in a global context to being a regional power in a regional context. And that this is part of that step. This is part of Australia wanting to adopt a more, a greater role in shaping the order of the region. And that's why I think it's important that these submarines are nuclear powered because of what nuclear power can enable submarines to do and where they can go and how long they can endure for. Uh, and as President Biden says, it does bind Australia, I think, closer to both the US and the UK. But it's vague, right? There's so many questions. There's, you know, a part of me just wonders, is this really just an agreement to talk for the next 18 months and kind of figure out some of the details? Because, you know, things could go haywire. Uh, they have in the past. I mean, ask Japan and ask France. But, you know, how much will the subs cost? How many? Like eight? Uh, we were, we were going to have 12. Does it matter that it's now we're now talking about eight? Uh, what will, when will we get them? What will the model be? Will it be the Virginia class model? Uh, what about basing? I've just seen before I came on that the UK, I think, is going to be basing submarines uh, in Australia. What do we do in the meantime? These, you know, how much of it is going to be built in Adelaide? And what do we do about the nuclear stuff? You know, there's just a whole range of questions uh, that, that are yet to be answered. And uh, we don't know for sure how AUKUS is going to play out, but then I think that probably there were people in the 1950s who were thinking, is that it? Where's the security guarantee when it came with it, when it came to ANZUS? So, you know, I think it is significant. But I think we also need to really, like, look at the detail quite carefully. And I expect that there's going to be lots more sort of piecemeal bits of information coming out in the future. It's interesting the differences between partnerships, alliances, um, you know, the guarantees, the, the focus on the different technologies. Uh, and uh, Pete, we we see the marquee program that was announced taking front and center in all the discussions on this uh, partnership. Um, and and you know, that was the main part of the announcement, the the joint release by the by the three leaders. Um, they highlighted the nuclear submarine program. Now it was. Quite a significant announcement. It was a little awkward, uh, and anyone following the Australian press at the moment understands it's a little awkward, uh, which is where we get the Orkies title in the um, in the in the show uh, tonight's episode. I remember your words, Mick. Um, but that awkwardness, you know, quite often happens when alliances or partnerships or defence capability programs are established. We know the submarine program has had its ups and downs, um, and the media loves to jump on these sorts of things. More, more important, I suppose, to our listeners and to our audience is not necessarily the awkwardness or what did or didn't go on um, behind closed doors, but it's about what nuclear-propelled submarines, and it's important, listeners, as, as, as Beck mentioned, to understand the difference. These are nuclear-powered, not nuclear-armed submarines. Why are they so significant, Pete? Why are they so significant for Australian strategy? Sure, and what I might do, if you don't mind, is sort of just preface this of, of sort of, it's been an amazing kind of like four or five days, like so much has happened. And, and I was thinking about this and how do we get to explain that it's actually about submarines and this sort of capability, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I thought I'll start with a few out, outtakes of, of how we sort of got to there and then I'll talk about this, the serious stuff. So we start with Biden forgetting who the bloke from down under is, right? In this, talk, talk about or we realise Australia's been gaslighting France for a good, you know, 18 months or so now over submarines. Gerard Arraud reminds us that the world is a jungle and, you know, comes back with a stab in the back theory. Then uh, Professor Caitlin Talmage of, uh, of Georgetown, who I think won the internet on the 17th of September with this tweet, you may call it backstabbing, but unless it's from the submarine region of France, it's just sparkling outrage, which is one of the best things. Nine, Channel 9 in Australia, 9 Gem rolled out the hunt for the Red October the same night the announcement was made. Now, is that coincidence or just ex expert changing of, of you know, um, signalling? 
Subway comes out the very next day trolling France. Subway, the, you know, the, the, the sandwich maker about how they're non-nuclear and much cheaper from Subway, <laughs> you know, in the United States. We get Dr. Joanne Wallace, a good friend of Beck and I's, who's out there deciding we need to invent a rom-com school of international relations to explain what the hell's going on here. Then we have the Doyon of Strategic Studies, Lawrence Freeman, schooling the very same Gerard Arroyd on Twitter over the deal. China trolling everyone in the region, but especially Australia, by applying to join the CTTPP in the middle of all of this, right, while also you're having trade sanctions on us. My, one of my personal favourites, uh, in the Australian newspaper, we have both Robert Gottliebson, the, the um the journalist saying, I've been, quote, overwhelmed by the thanks of my readers have extended to me for my role in procuring submarines. I'm sorry, old chap, I didn't even know you were part of the government. <laughs> Tony Abbott trolling the Australian public by saying the French deal was stupid, even though he was the Prime Minister that gave us the process that led to the French submarine. Morrison and Dutton trolling Linda Reynolds, like, again, the former Defence Minister, because clearly this started under her watch and she firstly didn't even get a mention. AUKUS trolling the EU by dropping this on the day of the release of their Indo-Pacific strategy, which, you know, no one's really been speaking about. And then the Australian government deciding after spending $2.4 billion to figure out we've got the wrong submarine deal, and now after nine years in office, we actually don't have a submarine deal. As Beck said, we have no deal. What we have on the table is an agreement to consult for 18 months. We don't have a submarine deal at all. And then off the back of spending $2.4 billion to figure this out, they're saying, trust us, trust us on nuclear, I'll say that again, nuclear-powered submarines, off the back of how well we've handled vaccines, quarantine, climate change, and a whole bunch of other public policy issues in Australia. So if we leave that to one side for a second, but it is a lot to take in. You know, yeah, and I think, we, I think we've seen the best and worst of, uh, of commentary on Twitter, but if we leave that to what is this this sort of headline grabbing part of it about. And the headline grabbing part is the nuclear submarines, right? So a couple of levels here, a couple of key things. From an ally point of view, and this is about working with the US in particular in the region, nuclear powered submarines are a really cutting edge technology. And what we're attempting to see from the US is them to bolster Australia's ability and the UK's ability to provide a greater undersea presence in the Indo-Pacific region. I mean, it still amazes me every time I think back about this, despite all that other stuff, that this is the US willing to share some of their most secret military technology that they've only ever shared once, and that was with the UK back in 1958, 1959, and we're led to believe that other allies have asked the United States and been told very clearly no. And certainly in the conversations I had about submarine capability in Australia over the last 20-odd years, Every time nuclear power has come up in discussions amongst my colleagues or officials or people who are much more expert than me on this, the answer is we don't have a nuclear power industry and we have political problems with nuclear power, but forget all of that because the Americans just won't share the technology with us. And that was sort of made apparent. And well, now they are. And I think this is a really major step. And this is where the sort of the technology sharing piece comes into it. On the submarines themselves, Australia's always suffered from the tyranny of distance. If you go back and read Geoffrey Blaney's fabulous um, um, book on that concept, our conventional submarines spend as much or more time on their transit to and from their base to get to patrol areas as they do in those patrol areas. They are vulnerable because they breathe air. They are vulnerable because they have limited endurance. They are vulnerable because they have limited range and they have limited speed because of, they're based on batteries and diesel engines. So one study um, done by CSBA a number of years ago estimated that a, a nuclear-powered submarine in, operating from HMAS Sterling in Perth could make a 77-day patrol inside the South China Sea, where one of our conventional submarines could manage just 11 days on the same patrol. And that fundamentally changes the calculus, whether it's in the South China Sea, whether it's in the waters to the north of Australia, whether it's in the Indian Ocean, whether it's off the choke points of Southeast Asia, this massively increases Australian capability. As Professor James Holmes from the US Naval um, uh, College wrote, you know, nuclear propulsion confers staying power in distance expanses, which bolsters the Allies' capacity to deter conflict and to fight and win if it's forced to. And that's kind of the, the key nub of of doing this. The other, the other really, really important considerations here is when you have all that additional power you have and space, you have additional weapon systems available. 
But the power, I think, is one of the real keys. With the expansion of the amount of power you have inside a nuclear submarine, you can run better sensors, more weapon systems, and most importantly, you have more capability to run autonomous systems, things using artificial intelligence and other advanced technology, which is really, by the look of it, where the future of undersea warfare is going. It's 77 days. Who wants to be underwater that long? That's that's all I could think of the whole time. Um, but it's uh, it's it's a very interesting sort of uh, delineator. What what can be achieved with such a cutting edge technology as you mentioned, uh, which means that force projection, force protection, and uh, and uh, well, it, it's almost gunboat diplomacy, but just you don't know if the gunboat's there um, can be achieved in a way that's uh, that's Australia hasn't really had that outreach capability before. Uh, particularly noting, and you mentioned it before, Pete, uh, the Indo-Pacific region. I guess I'll go to you for this question, Beck, because uh, you know you are the executive director of a um, Asia uh, <laughs> Institute, so you, you probably know a fair bit about our region. Um, what do you what, what do you think this new partnership means? Uh, I'm very careful not to use the word alliance. This new partnership might mean uh, for Australia and our relationship with our neighbours in the region. We've managed to hold off uh, not, not renaming ourselves La Trobe Indo-Pacific thus far. Uh, but, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, the first thing I want to say is we tend to think of France as being a European state, but if we think about it in maritime terms, it is an Indo-Pacific power. Uh, it's one of the few states that has territory and maritime claims that spread across the Indo-Pacific uh, it was the first European state to come out with an Indo-Pacific concept in 2018. The UK lagged behind considerably. So I think there might be a bit of smugness uh, in the UK uh, managing to kind of upend the Indo-Pacific's uh, um, of the, uh, France's uh, role in the Indo-Pacific in this, maybe. Maybe there's a bit of uh, rivalry there. Uh, but France has the world's uh, second largest exclusive economic zone by virtue of these territories uh, that it administers across the Indo-Pacific. Of course, the United States has the biggest exclusive economic zone and Australia has the third biggest. Uh, and in the Pacific, you know, France and Australia are neighbours. Uh, they, you know, French New Caledonia shares a maritime border with Australia in the Southern Ocean and, the, in, and in the Coral Sea. Uh, and France and Australia, uh, you know, there's been tensions historically around uh, their roles in the Pacific, uh, but they've been trying to deepen cooperation uh, through, for example, the Quadrilateral Defence Coordination Group uh, with Australia, New Zealand and the United States, really focusing on maritime security and running uh, joint patrol exercises in the Indian Ocean. France recently became a full member of the Indian Ocean Rim Association. There's been efforts to develop maritime security cooperation through the India-France-Australian Trilateral. And one of the things that often gets overlooked uh, is the Southern Ocean and Antarctica. And if my friend Liz Buchanan's out there, I'll give her a shout out because she's always saying the Indo-Pacific forgets its southern flank. And France is really instrumental uh, in assisting Australia in, um, in patrolling and in combating uh, illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing in the Southern Ocean. And their multilateral partnership in this space uh, is what has been, you know, over the last 20 years or so, has been really important uh, in, in uh, monitoring international fisheries uh, in and adjacent to Australia's exclusive economic zone. So that kind of relationship takes the pressure off Australia in trying to, um, to patrol and to police its extensive uh, maritime area. So I'd say that, uh, you know, security uh, is much more than submarines, as we know, but maritime security is also much more than submarines. And France is one of the few other states that have substantial maritime interests in all three oceans that surround Australia. And I don't think that we really pay enough attention to that. Uh, and so I don't think it's particularly smart to unnecessarily get France offside. I mean, I think the French are taking advantage of it and being a bit theatrical. Uh, but we also just didn't really do a very good job. 
uh, at, at managing that. We focus, uh, we focus a lot. I, think, I have to say, and maybe I, I, I'm thinking of Joanne Wallace and the rom-com thing. When I think about Australia and the US and the UK, I think that we're like the Allen from The Hangover. Like we just want to be in like the best friends club. And so we're really keen on that. And we're like, look at us, we're best friends. Uh, but we forget about our other friends. And you can't do that. Like the French are important too. So we're forgetting, I think, we want a favourable balance of power, but we're forgetting the importance of diplomacy. So I see France as being part of our region and a neighbour. And then, of course, uh, we've got a very mixed response from Southeast Asia. The Indonesians and Malaysians uh, don't seem uh, keen, too keen on this at all because they're concerned about what it means for an arms race in the region and whether this is going to be a destabilising factor, uh, hence the, the statement uh, produced by Australia to try to reassure ASEAN countries that this isn't an alliance or a pact. Uh, Indonesia, I think, is one to focus on. Our friend Nat Sambi wrote an excellent piece in The Strategist about Jakarta's major concerns, really being about the region's military balance uh, in, in, yeah, the military balance in the region. Uh, the Philippines seem a bit more enthusiastic. Of course, they're at the front line of China's assertions uh, and aggression in the South China Sea. Uh, and then New Zealand has been, I guess, a little bit cautious about it. We can't, we won't be able to, to visit New Zealand with our nuclear powered submarines because of the ban that New Zealand has. I haven't heard, I, I had a little look, but I couldn't see anything um, directly from any Pacific leaders. But given the nuclear debates in the region, I can't imagine that it's going to go down too well, uh, that Australia is now, without any consultation or without any kind of political public discussion, have decided to, uh, to go with nuclear-powered submarines. And I think we can talk all we want about ASEAN centrality and we can talk all we want about being a Pacific family, but we actually just need to do better with our diplomacy. Uh, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. You left it at just when I was posting a poll on the chat, so I had to quickly grab the microphone then, which is good. Um, yeah, listeners, there is a, there's a quick poll on uh, for those who are listening to it live in the chat. Uh, do you think podcast hosts uh, should be bearded? Um, yes, no, and if they can pull it off. Um, no other comments are required. Um, it's, just a, it's just a discussion I'm having with some fellow podcast hosts and i figured i've got a focus group so i was listening back um great stuff uh, there's a region we've got some people in it um but no i uh i've been to new caledonia um i went on a naval boat or ship they called it i called it a boat got in trouble um it's bloody close <laughs> um so it's it's really interesting sort of way of um framing it which we don't often see in the popular debate um understanding who has what territories where that uh in the Indo-Pacific region that most people outside of uh, international security, international relations and policy spaces might be forgetting. And, you know, we've got a lot of dunces that listen to this show, so it's good that they've been able to um, be educated as well. Um, and please, if you are a dunce who listens to the show, stick around. <laughs> I really need the listeners. Um, now we're going to go um, talk about AUKUS finally. This is, our, this is our question before our listener question. So I'd like to... Listeners who are in the chat, start posting your questions because I'll be picking it while Beck and Pete are answering this question. I'll definitely be listening to their answers. I'll be nodding attentively. You'll be able to see that in the video, but I'll actually be reading your, your questions there. Um, to be honest, I can't value add. These people are impressive, right? Um, so AUKUS, it's the forever relationship that it's been uh, announced as. Um, it is said to be a security partnership that will enable greater technology sharing. Now, all three of us have got some sort of involvement with academic institutions that support defence-related activities. Um, my question for both of you is, what will be necessary for AUKUS to be realised in terms of the relationship? How, how does it actually be become a successful security relationship? And uh, I'll go back first, and then I'll go to Pete. Well, nothing is forever uh, in international relations, but I have, the forever partnership stuff does. I mean, again, Alan from The Hangover, like let's just be BFFs. I, I just can't really stomach that. But I'm not sure that I've got a great 
answer. Uh, I think that the next 18 months is going to be uh, really, you know, see, there's going to be a lot of talking <laughs> happening uh, and that's going to really, uh, I guess, lay the pathway uh, for, for, you know, some sort of uh, firm commitment and some firm details uh, about what is going to happen. Uh, but I guess on the, the issues of things like security and, and tech sharing and cooperation, uh, I, and you mentioned we're all from universities that have, um, you know, that, that do stuff with defence industry and tech. Uh, I would just like to point out that the current Morrison government has been, has made things very difficult for the university sector. Uh, and I think that there are there will be opportunities for defence focused uh, universities. And Mick, you might be able to talk more about that than me. Um, but this could really be part of this push that we're seeing for universities to do research that's fit for the national interest. And I mean, it kind of scares. I find it deeply troubling that that's the direction that we're taking with universities. That we should just be kind of doing research that's going to help the government. Uh, to achieve what it sees to be its national interests. But uh, we have seen that, um, you know, various universities and the, and the G8 have come out with statements recently. They're keen to position themselves uh, to provide uh, in, in, in defence and, and um, science and, and sharing technology. Um, but, you know, we need other skills and competencies uh, and that, that universities deliver in terms of things like diplomacy. Like it's, we, we really should be, we can't just rely on submarines or any kind of just defence capability to secure this country uh, in the Asian century. Uh, and so, you know, we really need a whole of government approach. Uh, and that, in, that, that means properly funding universities. Uh, so I might not have given you quite the answer that, that uh, <laughs> you were hoping for, Mick, but it did give me a chance to kind of plug the fact that universities are a national interest in and of themselves. I definitely agree with uh, the, the concept of universities being a national interest and uh, I'm fully behind universities getting into uh, commercialisation and defence opportunities uh, as long as they don't uh, damage any other type of research incentive and I think that's 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 part of it so uh, you said I could probably comment better I, I definitely definitely could provide a comment uh, and my main comment would be that um, universities have an opportunity here um, but it doesn't necessarily always need to come at the cost of other important functions universities provide and I think uh, Australians are starting to see a little bit more conversation about how universities function within society which I think is actually good it's a tough time for people in the in the academic sector in some some areas right now but the benefit of it is universities are not silent uh, about it and there's an ongoing dialogue. And uh, in line with your di di diplomacy element, that's as diplomatic as I can be on the topic. Um, but for those listeners who listen to another show I produce, um, you'll, you'll, you'll probably find out more about it soon. All right, now, Pete, your, hey, look, your time to shine. My time to shine. <laughs> I find this thing interesting, you know, and we've done it in this discussion here. We've started really and focused a lot around submarines. But in the end, if you go back to the 11 minute and about 50 second announcement that was made last Thursday morning, and it was a very short announcement, and hence we don't have a lot of detail, as Becca said, or AUKUS is the top line headline here. That headline was stolen by nuclear submarines, which is actually the first project under AUKUS, which is actually about a technology sharing information partnership. That's what it's really about. So what we're talking really about here is how these three countries can work together around the, the technological industrial base, how we can talk about secure supply chains, how we can talk about quantum technology, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, space, cyber, data, information, disinformation and propaganda, foreign interference, economic coercion, critical infrastructure, supply chain disruption, all of those things are really fundamentally what the focus of this is about. And of course, the first big initiative is the, is the transfer and sharing of some of the most secret and sensitive technological secrets that the US and the UK possess. And of course, you know, it was put to me by someone the other day, it's like, well, what's the UK getting out of this when it seems to be Australia's getting the submarines? I'm like, this is only the first part. And of course, the last time the UK got sort of submarine technologies we discussed was a long time ago. So they're going to benefit from access to that technology as well. 
And I think this is actually the thing that's got lost in this. This is the what I've just described is the arena of 21st century competition between major states. This is where China and the United States are competing, where the EU is competing, where we're competing, where other states and territories are competing, which is this era of 21st century technology and growth. And this is why this is actually so critically important. Now, it's, it's been done in a ham-fisted way, which is, you know, possibly caused some real damage to another partnership with France. And, and one of the things I found most interesting about the French reaction, and I do agree that it's been a bit overdone, I mean, but as I said, I do think we also gaslighted them a bit. They, they knew quite well that this last submarine program was in real trouble, but we seem to diplomatically be going to two plus two meetings and leaders dialogues and saying the opposite, right? Um, and uh, so we've kind of put them out of the cold a little bit. And as Beck outlined, they're a really important partner. But the French seem just as annoyed about being left out of AUKUS as they were about losing a $90 billion submarine contract. Um, you know, and also think about the domestic political considerations and hence their action. But they seemed really miffed that they were put out of. And, of course, they've been pushing really hard on, a, on an Indo-Pacific strategy and Indo-Pacific engagement. Um, but this technological arena, I think, is, is very, very interesting. It actually should be the real headline of where we're going, but it's just, you know, it's not as sexy as submarines and stuff. Um, but it's, it's the top line, and we don't know exactly how this is going to play out, but I think what COVID has also done is really highlight some of the vulnerabilities we have in supply chains, like Australia and the, and the United Kingdom in particular found themselves going, oops, what do you mean we don't have a sovereign capability to do vaccines anymore? Um, you know, oh, what, what do you mean we don't have a sovereign capability to do personal protective equipment? Like, oh, so where else are we vulnerable in supply chains as a sort of integrated global network doesn't operate as well as it used to. And of course, um, when issues like this happen, sovereign states use the sovereign resources that they have for their own people in the, in the first instance in the first place. So I think this is gonna be really interesting and you can see similar, if you look at the quad, for instance, a lot of the discussion around the quad is actually about technology sharing um, and about partnerships as well. So this is a common theme that's starting to occur um, in, in some of these areas. And I actually think over the long run, while nuclear submarines have stolen the headline this time, what's going to be really important in watching the development of this partnership is really a technological sharing partnership and what that means. And it's actually also fascinating for what that means, as many people have, have raised the question, what does that mean for, for burden sharing in the alliances? What does it mean about expectations and commitments um, to potential conflicts and stuff around the region for, for all the parties involved? So we're now coming up with the audience question. Um, and we've also got some audience statements, including some trolls, which is good because we're doing a live show. Um, so for Mark Jackson, who's listening, uh, I can moderate the comments, mate. Um, so enjoy typing into your keyboard because nothing's coming up. Now, uh, we did have a response on the poll. Um, it was 66% if the host can pull it off, 25% uh, yes and 8% no. So that's very interesting on people's position on podcast hosts and beards. Um, it's interesting because most podcast hosts don't get seen. Now, we do have quite a few questions. There are some interesting ones. Now, for those who have submitted questions, I'm probably not going to go with the more tactical force structure type questions. Or as Pete and Beck just said, there seems to be a lot of focus on nuclear submarines, but AUKUS could be so much more, could have a large influence across uh, Australian society, including industry and academic uh, base and, and focuses. Um, so I'm probably going to go with a more strategic question. Um, but I do appreciate questions like which which class are we going to go with? That's interesting. I think that's one of the running questions. Um, we've got uh, we've got someone, uh, David Andrews, asking if there's going to be bigger decisions on the way. Withdrawal of Afghanistan, the announcement of SSNs, uh, AUKUS, what other announcements uh, are going to be coming along? Um, look, David, we're coming up to an election. So I think there's going to be lots of big announcements from now until the end of the election um, from every side of politics. So I can uh, I can just say, yes, there'll be there'll be, there'll be more announcements. Um, we've got questions on what benefits. This is actually something that could be very interesting, I think. Uh, so we've got a question from, uh, from Scott. Uh, besides submarines, um, and and you know the being part of the big announcement and kind of overshadowing the partnership announcement uh, as you said AUKUS was the headline submarines came in and stole that 
um, bit of subterfuge there. Um, now that's how you do a real pun, Pete. And uh, and and you know, the, there's there's been mixed reactions from our regional partners. So I'm going to combine a few questions here. So I've had questions on you know which ASEAN partners might be the X factor in in supporting or upsetting this. Um, regional partners, but the main question that I'm getting out of this, apart from those people that are really interested in Royal Australian Navy four structures, which are you know one. We three are definitely not the experts to comment on uh, this particular force structure question uh, right now, given that it's a pretty recent announcement. And also, um, I think the closest person to, who could discuss that is probably Pete uh, and his, his maritime work. So I'll just say, go read a lot of Pete's stuff and you'll start to see where he leans towards, um, you know, Royal Australian Navy force structure recommendations. But I think the question that seems to be coming out of our listeners is, and you can tell I've just been talking to play for time as I try and see if there's any more questions coming in, but the questions um, relate to what benefits does this point towards for, uh, for Australia and, you know, the US, the UK, but let's focus on Australia because we've all got Aussie accents on this show, including probably Mark Jackson, who's got a problem with my poll. Um, so I'm going to ask... Uh, Pete, you can uh, you can follow on. Uh, you, you you've got you've got some momentum here. So, what are the what are the potential benefits we see coming from this relationship? Yeah, look, I, I think the first thing to be a bit tactical and stuff is obviously what I spoke about for the first big initiative is is the opportunity here to get access to greater military technology. One of the things we've seen about the US Australian partnership, particularly since the end of the Cold War, and particularly during the global war on terror, was the very deep connections on a military to military level and interoperability level. Australia has been the beneficiary of, of technology from the United States, cutting edge military technology, which as a small middle power with a, with a you know, quite si a small size um, uh, Australian Defence Force has been really technologically enabled by that relationship with the United States. As Beck mentioned, one of the other things that came out of this an announcement that's often been overlooked is, you know, uh, a, a range, we got J-A-S-S-M-E-R missiles for our F-18s and F-35s, L-R-A-S-Ms um, for the F-18s, uh, we, we're looking at hypersonic programs, precision guided munitions, an accelerated guided weapons manufacturing um, and shipbuilding talent pool was also mentioned in there. Um, support for our life of um, time extension for our Collins class existing submarine fleet. You know, our brand new air warfare destroyers are getting a $5.1 billion upgrade. And, you know, they haven't been in the water very long. It's actually, a lot of it is about that technology transfer. But the one thing I'll, I'll and, and that's where the, the, the future often lies for a lot of this type of stuff. But it's also transferring, you know, we've got the, the, um, the Future Frigate Program, which is a partnership with the UK um, military and defence contractors and BAE systems and those types of things as well. But there could be, and I'll take a, a part of a Beck's statement before, there could be, and, and what I think is going to happen is a real lost opportunity here for Australia at the moment. There's as many risks as there is rewards here. And one of the big risks besides, and I'll leave aside, Beck can probably talk about the risks of our relationships with our, with our other partners in the region, um, but we have a real problem in this country at the moment that we have a lot of ideas going around about defence and security, but we don't have any real coordinated action. If you're going to look at this technology partnership, sovereign supply chains and stuff, as mentioned, universities are absolutely critical and key for this. But we have a government that's undertaking an ideological campaign against universities, cut us out of the job keeper scheme three times by changing the legislation, and 40,000 people in our industry have lost their jobs. We have a $270 billion investment over the next 10 years in our defence force structure, but DFAT have had funding cuts for nearly 10 years straight. We don't have an integrate, and we saw on display here, we made this big announcement about the security partnership with the Anglosphere, and the diplomacy of this with every other country involved was a god unlawful mess, like an absolute mess, and it wasn't handled well. We have a really bad problem with a whole of government approach. What we're doing in diplomacy and what we're doing in defence, and now what we're talking about in defence and other sectors in technology transfer, and I think... AUKUS will go well beyond just a defence and security lens of technology. We're talking about other economic cooperation and all that type of stuff. But there's lots of piecemeal of policies getting around in Australia at the moment, and none of it seems connected. And it doesn't mean seen as part of a vision or a, a clear strategic framework of where the country is going. 
And unless we can solve that problem, whatever benefits we may gain, you know, we're as likely to lose because of our inability to coordinate that and have a coherent approach to our diplomacy, our defence policy, our industry policy, our university and research and technology sector, you know, and the business and economic side of things. I mean, uh, you know, when Malcolm Turnbull for his brief time was Prime Minister, he spoke a lot about the tech and industry and innovation sector, and then that sort of just disappeared with the change of Prime Minister. Um, so I think that's a real issue that I have with, with where we're at with, with all of this. It seems very piecemeal and opportunistic and very uncoordinated from a central direction of where we want the country to go to ensure peace and security. And, you know, the massive big hole in all of this, the thing that is enormously missing is a thing, a little thing called climate change. You know, we may or may not go to war with China, and God, I hope we don't, but we know climate change is happening and we know we're going to have to deal with the effects of it, and that seems to be a massive hole in our security policy and a massive hole in our energy policy and a massive hole in our economic policy and a massive hole in our diplomacy as well. Thanks, Pete, for focusing on the benefits uh, of, of AUKUS. Um, ladies and gents, if you'd like to, to ch turn Pete's frown upside down, please post something nice and friendly in the uh, in the comments for him. I understand uh, where you're coming from, though, Pete, uh, and all of those things you mentioned can actually be benefits uh, if if they are coordinated, if, if they are driven towards both a diplomatic and a defence focus, if they are driven towards industry sector engagement, if they're driven towards research and technical engagement. So I think... Uh, it, it's it's some key points there about this could be quite beneficial for Australia, not just in the defence sector, defence sector, defence industry, technology sector, innovation. Uh, but it takes effort, just like everything. It takes effort to get there. Um, I've just noticed my iPad's quite bright because when the screen goes off, the lighting on me changes. Um, terrible, terrible application of lighting in the studio tonight. But that's not where we're at in the show. We are at the point where Beck needs to answer on the, And I'll just remind everyone, this question is about what are the possible benefits of AUKUS? Oh, I think he did cover them. Uh, <laughs> there's the technology issue and, you know, the fact that we may get some nuclear-powered submarines uh, in the future. I think... <laughs> How you see the benefits, I think, depends partly on how uh, you view Australia's relationship with the United States, uh, because this is a big bet. Like, Australia has really put a big bet on the United States, um, remaining a kind of, you know, reasonable or normal state, uh, noting that this didn't happen under the Trump administration, it happened uh, under the Biden administration. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a gamble here for Australia in cleaving so closely to the United States. Uh, and depending on where you sit, that can be a benefit because it's about anchoring the US in the region and about, uh, you know, obviously about um, uh, being able to uh, to get the, the advantages of the, the technology transfer and, and those sorts of things. Uh, but, you know, there's some real risks in, in, being, uh, in relying too heavily on, first, on defence and defence capability, and second, on uh, the Anglosphere, uh, the US and, and the UK. I think I made a joke on Twitter that uh, this is what Robert Menzies meant when he meant when he was talking about great and powerful friends, when you're in like a submarine related jam, that's, you know, your great and powerful friends will come and help you out of it. Uh, and so I think, you know, whether you see that as a benefit might depend on where you stand on Australia's reliance uh, on, or, you know, its, its dependence on the United States. Uh, the way that I see it is... Uh, the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper uh, outlined a vision of the Indo-Pacific that was about building partnerships with states beyond the, the US alliance, you know, building partnerships with India and Japan and Indonesia uh, and France even, uh, and that Australia needs to remain focused on that 
Uh, it's not just about consolidating our relations with past, you know, with, with very important allies, uh, but it's also about building the partnerships with other states in the region. I don't think that we should be putting all of our eggs into the one basket. And that's what it feels like with this announcement is that uh, there is a real, you know, a, a fear that we didn't think about other states. And we really need to be. And it goes back to Peter's point about, you know, uh, where we're positioned in Asia. Are we trying to, to be secure within Asia or are we trying to gain security from Asia? And I, I think we need to be um, paying a bit more attention to the rest of the region. I think I got a bit off topic with the, the question about the, the benefits. Uh, but, of course, you know, nuclear-powered submarines do. They have a lot more capability uh, as Peter outlined uh, earlier in the podcast, than the conventional uh, submarines. Uh, but that, as I, as I mentioned as well, is really demonstrates Australia's uh, order shaping role because as uh, the stat that Peter mentioned about 70, 70, uh, 77 days versus 11 days in the South China Sea, why are we in the South China Sea? What are we doing in the South China Sea? What do we want to do in the South China Sea? Do the ASEAN countries want us in the South China Sea? Like these are all questions that I get back to what Peter was talking about in terms of having a coherent approach. And we tend to do a bit of threat bundling in this country where we just talk about deterrence and, you know, um, we talk about the China threat, but actually, what, are, what do we want to do with the submarines? Uh, and I think that the, the fact that we're getting uh, or that, that the government is pursuing nuclear-powered submarines does tell us a bit about how we see our role in the region. Excellent. It's two, two significant answers. And listeners who subscribe to the TDP community will not be surprised that this question uh, has been answered in the way that it has. Uh, because this question replaces the normal bonus question that only only those paid subscribers get to listen to. And very rarely does a guest give a straight answer to that question either. So you two are in fine form. Uh, Pete's had a bit of practice at it. Beck, uh, Beck is a pure natural at it, uh, which is good. Um, so I do appreciate it because whether or not you answer the question directly, you know, it's, it's about the discussion. This show is about discussing big issues that relate to war and warfare. And, and nothing is more significant, I think, than security partnerships that involve large, new, cutting-edge technology, sometimes the scary words like nuclear in it, which is actually, you know, it's a very clean energy and we should adopt it for our power needs in Australia, but I'll leave that uh, off topic for, for some other people later on. But um, to quote one of my, my, my favourite diplomats, um, he helped reinstate a, uh, a, a, a nation, um, Bilbo Baggins. It's, uh, it's been a far too short amount of time uh, to spend uh, in the company of people such as yourselves, uh, but we need to get to the final question for each of you now. Um, Pete, I've got to stop calling it the final question when you come on the show, if you're going to keep coming on the show, because it's just the next question, I guess. So um, I'm probably going to go um, with Beck first, um, because she's never answered this question before. I don't need her cheating off your homework. Um, but uh, Beck, Pete, my final question is one I ask of all guests. It relates to our mission on the show is to define war in as many ways as possible, just like Big Carl, the dead Prussian himself. So I asked each guest to finish the sentence, war is. So right now, Beck, you first. I ask you to finish the sentence, war is. War is still not inevitable, but I fear that on current trends, it's getting more and more likely. Bleak, bleak, love it. Pete. Um, I have to say war is exhausting. It's, it's emotionally exhausting. It's physically exhausting. It's intellectually exhausting. Whether you're in war or you're trying to prevent war, um, if you're trying to maintain peace and stability or you're trying to see through to the end of a, of a war and conflict, it is all those things. And I, and I have to say, AUKUS has only been with us since 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in Sydney on Thursday and it is thoroughly exhausting already. Um, and the level of commentary is overwhelming. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'd have to say in a, in a nutshell, war is exhausting. It's a, it's a new one from you, Pete, and it's an interesting one. Um, you had me thinking, apart from uh, supporting everyone on Twitter while you were talking there, was um, one thing that we haven't had on the show is uh, no one said war is the norm. 
But that's kind of what struck me then. I know I've been, I've been interviewed on this show, um, <laughs> um, which is a bit odd for your own show. Um, but uh, you know, when I get when I gave it, I said, you know, war is the abject failure of humanity. But um, you know, I think what what you're saying there, you know, war preventing war is exhausting because war, war if you look at it, it's the norm. It, that's why we strive for peace. We don't strive for war because we we tend to be either in a state of preparing for or in uh, in war. So it's quite interesting, although Andrew Carr did have a tongue-in-cheek uh, comment about a particular nation and people always being at war with them, but I'm not going to put it in there um, just because I've got listeners in that part of Europe, so I'm not going to mention that European nation uh, that's just off the coast of Dover. Um, listeners, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Uh, thank you for those people who are viewers. Thank you for uh, attending our first ever live recording. Uh, I'm going to declare it a success without even looking at the stats, uh, apart from the ones I can see happening in real time, because uh, I don't have a studio tech to assist me. I normally do. All, I have to do all this stuff myself. Um, Pete and Beck, thanks very much for the uh, the very, very quick uh, rushed uh, coordination of this. Um, it's been fantastic um, to have you on board. Um, and uh, and Pete, thanks for um, thanks for being such a big fan of the show and, and, and think, not thinking this idea was crazy. Oh, and, and, you know, I've got to say, it's always a pleasure um, sharing the stage with Beck, who's absolutely fantastic to get along with you. On the other hand, you know, it's like, you know, the show's good. I'm there. For, I'm here for the listeners. You know, the, the beard, the grey hair, the dad jokes, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll survive. I'll put up with that for the, for the sake of hanging out with cool people like Beck. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. It's been a real delight. Uh, it's great to be here. And, you know, I like the beard, Mick. Uh, I have to say, it makes you look mysterious. Or you could be a barista in North Fitzroy. Yeah, there's no mystery without the beard. There's two chins under there. So there's no mystery. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, listeners, uh, that's all we have time for tonight. But as, as I mentioned, please, uh, please look at those options for subscribing to the show. Please give us a review on iTunes. Um, give us four or five stars. Anything less, just don't listen. If you don't like the show, don't listen. Like like the bloke that walked into the chat tonight. If you don't like the show, if you don't like me, which is a pretty standard response, just don't listen. I don't mind. I'm not here um, to make your life harder, and you don't need to worry about making mine harder. Um, I have school-aged children. It gets hard enough. Uh, but until next time, listeners, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is caught in the beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution license. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.